Thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, we're going to be talking about general data protection regulations, GDPR, and let's get started. So I'd like to go through a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, we can maximize, you can maximize or minimize the webinar pane during the presentation by using the red and orange arrow buttons. Um, during the webinar, we are also encourage everyone to ask questions. Um, in the webinar pane, you'll see a question box that you can use to type your questions in and click submit. And our presenters will answer those questions as time allows during our Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Second, to ensure good audio quality, please check your settings to ensure that appropriate audio option is selected. Um, if you're using a telephone, please click on the phone call audio option, or if you're listening through your computer, then please click on the computer audio option. And I now like to present a quick review of our CPE requirements. So to qualify for CPE, you must use a personal computer, no smartphones, and log in with your own information and unique URL. Be logged into our online software for at least 50 consecutive minutes within the scheduled time frame of the webinar. Actively respond to at least 75% of the polling questions. Complete the evaluation survey at the end of the webinar. And also please note, as a participant, you will receive a link to download the slide deck and the recorded pre presentation within 72 hours. So with that, let me introduce you our presenters for today. We have um, Liam Collins. Um, Liam is an Armenino partner and leads the firm's service organization control, SOC practice, which provides third-party assurance services. He also has more than 15 years of SOC experience in both the audit and consulting practice areas, including 10 years with big four firms. We also have Noah Baxton, one of our directors. Um, Noah runs day-to-day -day operations of the Armenino Risk Assurance Practice and leads a team fo focused on system and organization controls, so SOC, audits for small startups to large publicly traded companies, as well as IT and cybersecurity audits across industry verticals and security frameworks. Noah has more than 10 years of audit legal, IT, and regulatory experience, and is a member of the Information System Audit and Control Association, the American Institute of Public Accountants, and the, and the California Bar Association. So what are we gonna to learn today? Well, um, we are learning, our learning objectives are to help you gain a comprehensive understanding of the new GDPR compliance guidelines, Evaluate the impact of these rules on your organizations and develop a plan for bringing your organization into compliance prior to the deadline. And so with that, I'm going to hand it off to our first speaker, Liam. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, Sarah says, I'm Liam Collins. Um, so what we're trying to do today is essentially give you a good introduction to GDPR. It's a very hot topic, both for our clients, lots of prospective clients, um, and a very big issue here in the US, and lots of misunderstanding, I think, about you know, the requirements that GDPR has, especially for companies in this country. So I'll give you a good introduction to GDPR, what it means, what it is. We're gonna talk through some of the key implementation requirements for GDPR. So we put together some detail around what we think are the key steps for companies here in the US to become compliant with GDPR here in the short term and then walk you through some of the key documentation requirements that you will need to demonstrate compliance on a go-forward basis. Okay, so we're on to our first polling question. You will see that on your screen shortly. So, the first question. How knowledgeable are you about GDPR and its requirements? Is it A, very knowledgeable, B, moderately knowledgeable, not knowledgeable at all, or how did I get here? Um, also, guys, please remember, uh, you need to answer about 75% of your polling questions to get CPE credit. It seems like we have a few votes already in. 
I'm gonna, we're going to keep the polling questions on for just a little while longer so that everybody's answers are captured. All right, so we're going to close the polling question in a couple of seconds. So three, two, one. And here are results. It seems a lot of people are not so knowledgeable. So what do you guys think about those answers? Uh, it's not surprising. It's a very complex regulation, lots of misunderstanding, as I said, in this country. Um, so we're certainly happy to walk through some of the details today to hopefully um, educate people on what we've learned. Um, and of course, the how did I get here answers, you know, many people are getting stuck with, um, here's a new opportunity for you to help lead our company's GDPR program. So we understand that uh, for new, lots of people, this is very, very new. So hopefully we can uh, give some uh, good education. And we also see some other questions coming in. We will be sending out the slide deck to everybody who attends as well. Um, there's lots of content in here that I think will help lots of companies with their implementation program. So you guys will also be getting this deck um, very shortly after the webinar. Yes, you guys will get this deck within 72 hours. So here you go, intro to GDPR. Perfect. So. GDPR, um, jump to the bottom first. It is effective May 25th of this year. It's basically a follow on to the EU data directive from 95. So we're thinking back 23 years when the prior privacy law went into effect um, in the EU. Actually, not even a law, it was a directive, a uh, list of requirements that ideally each country was supposed to put into law um, in their own constitutions. Uh, lots of variation of how these were implemented uh, and enforced across the EU. Um, the, the levels of communication, sophistication, technology 23 years ago was very, very different. Lots of paper communication. Facebook didn't even exist. So there really was a need to have a new regulation put in place to protect people's data privacy. Uh, lots of work went into this. The exposure drafts were written many, many years ago. There was lots of comments on them. Much negotiation over a three-year period to essentially come to what we now have as the, the current GDPR regulations that will go into effect. Still lots of information I think that needs to be garnered as we go forward. Uh, lots of case studies that I think will happen in the first two or three months of when the law has gone into effect and around really how are we going to enforce the requirements. Um, so still, still things up in the air with respect to how it's going to play out, but um, I think a much needed enhancement of privacy regulations for folks both here and in the EU. So the scope, um, we get lots of questions around, does this apply to us? What does it apply to you essentially? Um, the material scope, personal data. So it's really, it's very clear there's a four part test. It's information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. Um, and those two words are also very important, identified and identifiable. Identified being very easy, but you know, identifiable means a lot of different things. Um, so for example, anonymous data is not subject to GDPR. <clears throat> So if you've actually hashed the data in your systems, it's unreadable, nobody can actually trace it back to that data subject, um, then that is not subject to GDPR and not, you don't have to follow the requirements um, in this situation. Pseudonymous data is different. Uh, pseudonymous data is essentially data that hasn't been fully scrubbed that you could potentially tie back to an individual. So an example that we hear is, if you see a publication that says the CEO of X company makes between 10 and $12 million a year, that example and that data would then be subject to GDPR because it's possible that you could identify that person using those data elements. Uh, so therefore, there's lots of uh, breadth to the kinds of data that could be included. Um, and pseudonymous data is a new concept that really came into place with GDPR. And then the territorial scope. Um, obviously, if you're a company in the EU, you're going to be subject to this uh, GDPR regulation. Um, if you have offices there, you're going to be subject to the law. But if you're in the US, um, there's two main requirements for you to be subjected to GDPR. So if you're offering goods or services, even if you're not getting paid um, to anyone that actually lives in the, ER, in the EU, then you would be subject to this law. Or if you're monitoring behavior, um, as long as that behavior takes place in the EU, uh, then again, you would be subject to GDPR. So for companies in the US, um, Lots of companies who do not have offices in the EU will now be required to be compliant with this new regulation. So there's multiple data elements. 
regulated by the GDPR. The basic stuff, um, historical, financial, all of this would have typically been considered to be personally identifiable information. Um, but now we're adding in also social information. So uh, your social network details, anything that you have on Facebook, for example, anything that can be tied back to an individual, all that is now subject to GDPR. Um, Real-time data, including cookies information, um, device-dependent tracking, geotagging, essentially. Again, all of that comes into the scope of GDPR in this new iteration. And then sensitive information, uh, very much similar to somewhat PHI in the US, but race, ethnic origin, et cetera. Um, the general consensus is you should not be processing sensitive information unless you have a number of safeguards in place. So there is, over and above the standard requirements for processing GDPR for sensitive data, there's an additional level of requirements that you have to have in place around explicit consent, uh, technological and operation controls, essentially, um, and a long list of things. So um, we have more details on that later, but sensitive data has been called out separately in the GDPR. And for you all to make the connection with existing privacy knowledge that you have, um, think of this as essentially as, as personally identifiable information, PII, uh, what we think of in the US privacy law. So. This is a single piece of information that identifies a person directly uh, on its own, uh, or it's that uh, it's an N plus one. That piece of data plus something more um, will allow you to identify that specific person. Uh, two major entities that will be covered. So a data controller. So if we think about a data controller, this is the company or organization that actually decides what data should be collected and what would be done with that data. Uh, so if you think about an employer, um, that would be a good example. So if you've got employees in the EU, uh, they have that data, that entity would be considered to be the data controller. Uh, the data processor, which we'll see many, many of the companies in the US will be designated as the data processor. They're essentially the company that acts as the direction of the data controller. So they will do what they're asked to by the company that owns the data. So an example, if you're a, a software as a service provider, um, if you've got your client's employee data in your system, you are the data processor for that data controller. And so previously in the old directives, there was not direct requirements or issues with uh, respect to what you actually had to do. Um, but now you actually have lots of legal requirements on you as a data processor that you have to follow. I think there's a, a good note here also that some of you on the call may be thinking, well, which one am I? Um, and, and oftentimes, the truth is that uh, an organization can be both a data controller and a data processor. Um, so think about that for your organization. The examples that Liam gave of you know being the employer of those uh, employees that may reside in the EU or be EU citizens, uh, and also you know uh, processing data um, on behalf of a, a controller or a customer that you work with. I think a great example that we can all relate to is Facebook. We know we would think of Facebook as a data controller. Um, we give them uh, our data to, to use, um, you know, in conjunction with using their platform. And uh, they are certainly a, a data controller in that respect. They also operate as a data processor in certain respects. Um, when uh, organizations give them CRM data and information about their customers uh, for targeted marketing purposes, then uh, Facebook becomes a data processor. And so there, there's lots of examples of that crossover. And so you've got to kind of consider, you know, where does our organization fall with respect to both of these activities? Okay, so we are on to our second polling question, um, which you'll see on your screen in a minute. So, so, so given what I know now, I think my business is um, primarily a data controller, be primarily a data processor, see both, or D, neither. So Liam and Colin, do you think this is kind of like a trick question? What do you guys think of the question itself? It is a difficult question. And lots of companies really struggle with that definition of really, do you own the data? Are you responsible for deciding how that data is processed by another party? Or are you a data processor? So it can be very difficult for companies um, to understand where they sit in the value chain. Um, we're seeing most co companies over here are quite frankly data processors. Um, lots of clients that we work for, especially in the technology industry, uh, they're providing you know, software to their customers and therefore they're the ones that are processing the data on behalf of the controllers. Um, so that's where we're seeing the majority of companies over here. All right, so let's see what our audience has. Um, we're gonna close the poll in three, two, one. And 
here are the results. So it seems we have 37% of people who say both. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think that sounds about right because you know, really, um, if you're if you're doing any business, uh, any global business, uh, say you're operating a software as a service platform, um, you may have contractors or employees that sit in the EU. Maybe they do development activities or you know, customer support activities, um, customer success activities. So, um, you know, it, it really does um, end up being that a lot of these companies, a lot of organizations, will straddle the line and 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 operate in both spaces. Perfect. And then just a quick overview of some of the, the key principles of the GDPR. Um, this follows very much on from the directive um, and from what we would expect around good privacy governance. Make sure you've got lawful, fair, and transparent use of the personal data, that you're very clear about the data that you're collecting, what you're going to do with it, that we're being very transparent with the data subjects around how we use, collect, disseminate, and store their data. Um, data protection by design is key. So really thinking about when you're bringing in new software products or you're building out new lines of service, really bringing privacy, governance, and protections into the very foundation of how you build those products. Um, great controls around security, confidentiality, and integrity are required. So really, what has your organization done around building good controls to make sure that the data cannot be misappropriated, that data is indeed secure, you're protected from data breaches. Uh, we have some new data breach res uh, requirements that are in the GDPR that we'll talk about later, but essentially requiring you to respond within 72 hours if there's a data breach, which is a much more stringent requirement than most companies are currently dealing with. And then essentially, which we saw earlier from most of our clients are being data controllers um, on the webinar, you, you are the primary entity responsible for compliance. So your data processor will sign an agreement with you, but very often um, the independent um, supervisory authorities are going to come after the data controllers with respect to the penalties and the fines that we'll go over in a little bit. That's exactly right. And so, as, as Liam said, really these responsibilities at the top level um, are, are focused on um, and, and required by the controller. So, um, and, you know, as part of that, uh, the controller is essentially responsible for the fundamental right to privacy that, that's enshrined in this law is really what it comes down to. And there's a number of uh, associated rights or you know rights that go along with that. And so let's touch on those at a high level. And then we'll also kind of dig into those just a little bit deeper in sort of the implementation steps. You know, we'll give you all a little bit more information, a little bit more concrete information about what steps need to be taken uh, to deal with each of these rights. So the right of access is the simple right uh, that a data subject can have access to the data that the controller uh, and its sub-processors uh, process. Um, right of access to that data that's been given to the controller. Uh, the right of rectification is, is the right that the data subject has to ensure that that <clears throat> data being processed is actually accurate, that it's, uh, it's the true data about them. And so uh, a, a somewhat associated right is the right to erasure. Uh, probably one of the, the ones that we see most, uh, the one that's uh, most of you are familiar with is the right to be forgotten, as it's as it's called in shorthand, and uh, it's it's really the right to have that data removed. It's the right to opt out. It's the right to um, to say I no longer want to be a part of this collection or this program that I once opted into or consented to, um, and I'd like my data to be deleted. And there's a lot of requirements that flow out of that. Uh, right to restrict processing is essentially the right to uh, is a coordinate right to object to that processing and to actually ask the controller to put that processing on hold for a number of given reasons, uh, which we can go into. Uh, the right of data portability is the right of the data subject to say, hey, I'd like to have a copy of my data in a, re a readable and usable format. And so there's a lot of processes that need to flow out of that, as you can imagine. Uh, and then rights related to automated decision making is essentially the right of the data subject to not have decisions made about them uh, for say credit profiling or uh, contract um, acceptance uh, you know, by a machine without human intervention. And then one of the big drivers obviously for compliance, the, uh, the penalties, which are fairly significant. We're looking at the greater of 4% of your global revenue are 20 million euros. So that can be a very, very large number. There are a number of steps that the supervisor and authorities will consider when they're coming up at what the fines could be, because it's not necessarily always going to be 4%. Uh, it can certainly start at 1% or even lower, but really it goes to the nature of the infringement, how serious it is, was it the infringement actually intentional or was it just negligent? Um, did you do or have good mitigating controls in place, uh, good preventative measures in place? Um, do you have a history of 
uh, infringements. So if you're a company that this has happened to more than once, they're going to start upping the fines on you. Uh, as you can see, that's a very large number if you're looking at 4% of your global revenue. Um, and then, of course, you have the other risks to your business. Uh, you're going to have to put in new processes if you do have an infringement um, that will actually mi mitigate the future risk to the company. But you have the big reputational risk. So if you are out there as one of the companies that has been fined or has had a penalty, I'm guessing this is going to go public very quickly. Um, and obviously, you've made your reputational risk around how you've protected your customers' data. So. Fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to uh, address a, client, uh, a question as it's coming in because I can see it here and it actually relates to what I'm going to talk about on this slide. So uh, any technology solutions that might be able to help me get there quickly or sustainably, um, basically looking at certain technology tools, maybe ISMS online um, and others. Um, yes, we're seeing a lot of that. There's a lot of activity in the marketplace. Um, we are aware of that, that, the solution that was mentioned, ISMS online. Um, providing a platform for documentation, um, compliance frameworks, um, you know, privacy controls, essentially, to, to manage these privacy programs. Um, and there's also, you know, a, sort of the related question uh, of certification. How do we show that we're compliant? Um, how do we show that we're, quote unquote, certified? Um, and so, really, there is no uh, compliance certification at this point in time. Um, there is certainly room for it in the law um, and the data protection authorities uh, we'll be working towards um, outlining, I think, a certification uh, for GDPR. It certainly seems necessary in the marketplace uh, what, from what we're seeing. So um, I just wanted to speak briefly to, you know, I guess really in practical terms for those on the call, when you're asked, are, are you GDR, uh, GDPR compliant? Are you certified? The answer is, well, we're not certified because we can't do that yet. Um, but we've taken steps, uh, you know, to become compliant with GDPR or we, you know, those steps are already in place. And so really there's, there's existing privacy standards. Um, the EU-US Privacy Shield is really the mechanism, the, the self-certification program um, that's been used for international data transfers under the Data Protection Directive and all those associated acts within the EU. Um, and so that, that is still um, a, a very valid certification in terms of uh, international data transfers. So uh, in the healthcare space, uh, the High Trust Alliance um, who operates and maintains the CSF framework uh, have, have implemented uh, some controls around GDPR and so healthcare companies now have the opportunity to, to, to add that to their audits and their reports. Um, I think from a governance standpoint, you know, member organizations out there are offering, um, you know, compliance programs and education and I think that is certainly something when we're talking about the, uh, the requirement for data protection officer and proper governance to ensure that, you know, those with the rights, with the responsibilities have the proper training and resources necessary. There's the existing uh, existing frameworks that are out there. Many of you will be familiar with COVID-5 and the, the privacy principles um, associated uh, for implementing these programs. And then, you know, there's a number of reporting standards. Uh, one of the ones that Liam and I work under um, very frequently is, is the AICPA's uh, SOC 2 Trust Service Principles. And uh, we're starting to work with clients to demonstrate their GDPR compliance by adding the privacy trust service principle uh, to their reporting and actually testing some of those controls. And so that we think that that's a really great way to get an attest opinion um, on your actual compliance program with respect to GDPR. I guess also just to provide some context, you know, what they're saying right now is 70% of the companies in the UK, and obviously the UK is very heavily regulated, will not be compliant by the deadline. Uh, in the US, that number is much higher. So the compliance posture for most companies will not be in place by May 25th. Um, so there's lots of work to be done. Um, so I guess being out there and maybe not being knowledgeable about this yet, you're certainly not alone. Lots of other companies are just starting to figure this out, especially in this country where many people in many country companies have thought it just did not apply to them. And in fact, as they've dug into this more, they're figuring out, yes, indeed it does. And they have lots of work to do both before the deadline and also ongoing because the law does say that you have to be able to demonstrate on an ongoing basis how you are compliant with GDPR and how you've responded to each of the data subject rights. So lots of opportunity for um, areas that we could help. Uh, one of our viewers, Eric, asked a very relevant question, um, and it goes to fra existing frameworks. Can I use ISO 27000 series of 27001 and 2, respectively, as a way to uh, implement controls or a system around GDPR compliance? Um, yes, definitely. Um, it doesn't in and of itself um, satisfy necessarily all GDPR requirements, but it does. It is it is a very good framework um, for 
the security requirement and, and privacy by design, right? So having a, a governance structure, a risk management framework in place is really part, part, part of the underpinning of this um, to ensure the data is secure, kept secure. Okay, so uh, we're on to our third polling question. I'm um, gonna see it on your screen in a few minutes, a few seconds actually, there you go. Which of the following is an impact of GDPR non-compliance? So we're testing how well you guys were listening. Um, is it A, regulatory fines, B, um, add, add, my, add fee to defend lawsuits and build infrastructure, C, potential risk to organizations good standing, or D, all of the above. Again, I want to remind everyone that you have to answer about 75% of the polling questions so that you can get CPE credit. All right. Let me give you guys a couple more minutes, or a couple more seconds, actually. And I'm going to stop in three, two, one. All right. So the results. Well, it seems like most of you were listening. 96% say all of the above. We're very happy to see that everybody's listening, <laughs> even with our scratchy voices, uh, Liam and I over here at the end of cold season. So we appreciate it. Uh, I'm seeing some really great questions come in, um, and I, uh, you know, to make it useful and valuable for you all, we want to try and address those. They're 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 actually streaming in, so doing our best to capture them all. But um, I saw one that was, how do we uh, <clears throat> how do we um, uh, define organization? Um, you know, really, this can be a very small organization that could be subject to GDPR. It's anybody controlling or processing the personal data of an EU subject uh, or someone in the EU at the time of processing. So. Um, there are another question that's coming in as well, just to address it on the fly here is I'm only seeing part of it, but it's, it's about, uh, I think the carve out for less than 250 employees uh, or organizations with less than 250 employees. Um, that is true. That is enshrined in the law. Um, a lot of this really has, has yet to shake out, frankly. So this will be determined by future enforcement actions as well as interpretation on, you know, adjudication and litigation of those enforcement actions, um, by the, by the European courts. Um, and so essentially what we do know uh, is that for smaller organizations, not doing massive processing or processing at a large scale, huge collection programs um, or large storage, yes, the, the, the documentation requirements and the compliance requirements uh, will, will essentially be a little bit more lax. Um, and that's really, if there were an issue and if there were an enforcement action, you know, there would be, um, less scrutiny placed because of, again, the size of the organization, the resources, um, et cetera, so. Well, and we we're about to touch upon the requirements to comply, but there's lots of things that both large organizations and, and smaller ones can certainly do, even from a documentation perspective, um, to actually demonstrate they've done their due diligence and they've put the right documentation in place um, and processes in place to respond, both from avoiding the fines, but also keep, keeping a good reputation. So we're gonna walk you through some of those details. So the first thing um, we're suggesting to our clients, and one of the requirements is you should do a data mapping, um, essentially have an inventory of the data subject to the GDPR, where it sits in your systems, what kinds of data is in there. Uh, this is standardly, it's required for companies that are uh, processing data that could be you know, of high risk to the data subject, um, large scale processing, et cetera. We do think it's a good thing for all companies to do. Um, there's different ways that you can do this. Maybe larger companies are looking at using tools that can actually scrape the system that they have, do an actual data mapping, and really have a robust program around dynamically managing where that data sits um, and managing it on an ongoing basis. Other companies, maybe smaller, are actually going in and doing more of a manual process where they're identifying, they're putting together a spreadsheet that says, here's all the systems that we have that we think we may have some of this data sitting in. Here's the controls that we have around those systems. Um, but not necessarily going to the level of doing the automated and the, the system data mapping from a you know a technical perspective. So there's different ways you can get this information, but this information is also going to be very necessary when you do have to respond to rights of erasure requests or rights of portability requests. So 
if you do get a call from a data subject or a data controller that says, you know, we need you to go into your systems and erase the data with respect to this specific individual, then obviously it's going to be very helpful if you know where that data is and you know where to look um, and make sure that you've actually scrubbed it from all of the systems that where that data might sit, which is definitely going to be one of the issues for clients where they're thinking, you know, if the data is sitting in four or five different systems, are you really comfortable that you have that information and that you have a process in place to make sure it's, it's dealt with in each and every one? One follow-up on that. Key documentation, if you're thinking, what do I absolutely need to have in place for that requirement? Uh, probably a risk register, uh, identifying the risks you've identified during your study, um, and really an in information asset register or inventory is, is really the best way to document those things. All right, let's talk about the lawful basis for processing. This is um, really a huge part of the law, um, and we could probably do a dissertation on it. We could probably spend an hour on this just alone. Um, let's touch on the high points. There's, there's really uh, six uh, different lawful bases for processing under uh, the GDPR Article 6, um, and they're consent, contract, legal obligation, vital interests, a public task, or legitimate interests. I think it's, you know, for the purposes of today's call, it's best, uh, Liam will talk in a little bit, uh, in just a moment, uh, more on consent. Um, most of this law really focuses on consent and, and changes to the way that um, consent is obtained and maintained. And so um, some of the others that will apply to you on the call and, and most of the clients that we work with, uh, again, consent, uh, contract, certainly doing processing activities for a controller. Um, those are governed by contract. You're relying on perhaps the consent of the data controller. And so those, contract, those um, contractual agreements become very important as well as uh, a required data processing addendum or data processing agreement, uh, sometimes called. And so um, we'll skip over kind of legal obligation, vital interest, public tasks. Those are a little bit more nuanced. They probably don't apply um, to most companies uh, or most organizations that would be on the call today. Um, but let's talk about legitimate interests. Um, really, any, any organization can have one or more of these lawful bases for processing in place. Um, and a legitimate interest is one that, um, as a good example, a lot of uh, marketing companies are using. Um, they're saying, you know, we, we have these lists, we're doing direct marketing, we're doing reach outs, we don't have consent uh, from all of those people on our, in our CRM necessarily, um, but we're actively reaching out to them. And so that's a, that's a claim of legitimate interest. We've got a legitimate interest in reaching out to them uh, for services that they may have once, uh, you know, uh, expressed an interest in online or otherwise. Um, and so um, I, I guess I would say the other thing here is really that if there's if there's any change in the way that you're doing business or collecting data, that uh, this really needs to be reassessed on an ongoing basis as things do change. So we'll move on to consent now in a little more depth. Yeah, and as Noah mentioned, consent is a big issue, and the regulators really took a look at this and were not comfortable that the companies were giving the data subjects enough information that they really were giving consent. Um, and so they put the word unambiguous into the regulation to make it very clear that for consent to be valid, it should be unambiguous. It does not mean that your data subject has to click an opt-in button, but there has to be very clear and plain language so that they understand that what they're doing is giving you consent to have and use their data. Um, they should make sure that they're letting the data subject know that also they can withdraw their consent at any point in time. So this all has to be available to them either on the website or in any contract so that it's very clear to that data subject what their rights are. Um, that's really unambiguous consent. If you're processing sensitive data, which I talked about earlier, which is the healthcare, um, race, ethnic origin, et cetera, then it has to be explicit. Then you really do have to get something like an opt-in button to say, I'm explicitly giving you this consent. There are, again, some um, instances where that's not required, primarily in the healthcare instance. If you are going to your doctor, you're going to a hospital, you're in an emergent situation, you're not capable of giving consent, uh, but you've gone there for, for getting treatment, um, then that's going to be taken to be explicit consent because you need that treatment. And just by the fact that you're going to the doctor, that you've given that. Um, if you're dealing with children and children's data, that's a little bit different as well. You need to have a process in place to actually validate and verify the age of the child. Um, if they're 13, year, 13 years or under. And then you also have to obtain a parent or guardian's consent um, if you want to rely on the consent from a lawful basis or processing perspective. So you do certainly have a lot more requirements in the GDPR than you had previously with respect to consent. Um, 
the clients we're talking with right now are really a lot of them in terms of programmatic uh, ways of obtaining consent, right, uh, through websites and and click throughs. They're really having to design redesign uh, this with with all these things in mind. So um, keep in mind what you might uh, need to revisit or redesign in your processes. I want to thank everybody for their questions. Um, they're they're literally streaming in, so we're trying to you know, uh, take as many as we can um, to make it useful and, and respond to these things on the fly, but we can certainly uh, follow up with you after and, and make ourselves available for any detailed questions. Um, I think one that's a, a really interesting one is how is this going to impact the DNA testing companies? Uh, you know, that's, um, I think, yet to be determined completely, but uh, certainly that information falls under um, sensitive information, right? And so the way that uh, those companies need to implement privacy programs is much different. Their privacy policy uh, is probably going to be quite a bit more robust um, than, say, a marketing company or um, you know, a social media company. Uh, and in addition, the consent requirements are um, extremely robust as well. And those are some of the things that Liam just talked about. But uh, GDPR certainly does affect them. It is sensitive data. Um, and the consent requirements um, will be need to be strictly adhered to and, and revisited um, ability to opt out um, or uh, uh, remove consent or withdraw consent uh, will be a huge issue for those companies and doing that programmatically. So um, let's see if there's another question. I'm going to hand the question to Liam, see if uh, he can uh, address one. I'm going to talk about right of access for just a moment um, to make sure we keep moving along. So the right of access is something I talked about at the top. It's the basic right uh, for the, the data subject to know what you have on them um, and to understand why it's being processed. <clears throat> and so really when it comes down to implementation, the, the concrete stuff that you all need to know is you really have to have a process in place for this. And I'll keep saying that through a number of these, but it's really about defining a process, whether it's, it's a manual human in a, a type of process or it's some type of workflow within your existing systems. Um, to really track these requests. So if you're a controller, you're directly responsible for these right of access requests. If you're a processor, you have to you have to have this conversation with your controller, with your with your customer, your data controller, to know, you know, how are we going to trade these requests? What what are the lines of communication? If I receive the data processor receives a request, do I do I do I respond to that request directly, or do I work with the data controller? And so these things, these are the things that are outlined in data processing agreements to really define the rights and responsibilities of each party. Um, you have to have a method to to provide the information um, in a secure format, um, and it needs really needs to be approved by management before this type of um, activity can happen. It needs to be free of charge, essentially, unless it's you know. Um, really a burdensome exercise for the organization to pull that information. You have to do, you have to respond to these type of requests within a month, um, unless there's some reason to extend, and there can be some justification given. So, I'll grab actually a couple of quick questions too. Some of some of the specific questions. So, one question is: If you're a school trying to recruit students from the EU, does GDPR apply? And absolutely, it does. Um, you're essentially marketing or offering services to EU data subjects, and therefore you would be subject to GDPR. Um, is the UK also included post the vote to leave the EU? Um, yes. Um, so right now, you are included because. The, Brexit hasn't officially happened yet, and even after Brexit happens, um, there will be a law in the EU that essentially merged GDPR, um, and therefore the requirements will stay the same. And then lastly, who enforces GDPR? So each of the member states will have supervisory authorities, and those will be the entities that will essentially enforce GDPR. If there is a complaint to them from a data subject because of a lack of response from a data controller or a processor, essentially they would be the one that would follow up on this. They will be the one doing, doing the audits. Um, and interestingly enough, there is a requirement or there was a requirement for all companies to register and pay a fee if they were doing data processing. Uh, that fee and that registration is no longer required. And one of the reasons it's not required is because they expect the penalties and fines that come from GDPR to more than fund each of the supervisory authorities' um, activities. So uh, these agencies are certainly expecting to follow up very aggressively uh, on GDPR violations. So to jump on to the next area, right to rectification uh, and data quality. So essentially, if a data subject believes that you have incorrect information on them, they have the right to have you fix that. Um, so the rate of access should be done within a month unless there are mitigating factors that would suggest that it's too difficult to do. 
Uh, an example might be if you call your cell phone provider, uh, they have your wrong name on, on file or they misspelled it. You, you know, that's an example where they would then have to go and correct it from each and every one of their systems and then go back and prove to you that they've actually done that. Um, very simple example, um, but that's something that companies will also need to have a process in place to deal with. Perfect. The right of erasure, uh, the big one that everyone's talking about. So uh, this is really the right to be forgotten. Uh, and so you can see on the slide, I won't read the slide to you who it applies to, but really uh, like here again, you need to have a process in place. Uh, and here again, the written contract with the data controller becomes very important to understand how this process is gonna take place. Um, really, it should be enshrined in a written policy um, and, you know, if, if requests were received, for instance, from a processor um, to erase the, uh, the, the information, it, it really needs to be, a, uh, there needs to be a line of communication or a process or a workflow uh, for working with the controller uh, to remove that information or um, at least notifying the controller that such a request has been made. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess I can give a real world example. Um, uh, a lot of the companies that are organizations that are probably on the line have have systems, uh, you know, technology systems. One of the clients I was working with just last week um, is in the retail space, um, and they they run a essentially a, a membership reward program uh, because their system is based uh, on an API. Essentially, um, you know, an API call to the database uh, will delete that data. They can they can make that happen very easily, um, and so. You know, in a programmatic respect, these things are, are easy to build into workflows, or I guess <laughs> somewhat easy. Um, you know, and so you should think about, you know, what technology can we use um, to, to make these things happen? Um, I think one interesting talking point, I don't think I've seen a question on it yet, but is backup systems. Um, you know, if I receive a right uh, or a request to erase my data, do I have to erase it from my live production database as well as all my backups? Uh, the answer is technically yes, uh, and realistically no, <laughs> I would say in short. And so, um, yes, technically the law does require that. However, uh, you know, there's a reasonableness uh, requirement there as well. And so to go into a backup and restore it, uh, restore a backup uh, of a database and to go in and delete a specific record and then archive that, that backup back down, uh, in most cases is going to be... Um, infeasible um, or unreasonable uh, for most organizations. And so as long as you've got these things defined in your uh, data retention policy um, and you can easily communicate your practices um, in response to these types of requests, that's really what you need to do. Skipped over a slide, excuse me. Right to restrict processing. No worries. Um, so right to restrict processing, very simply, is if a data subject believes that you have inaccurate data on them, um, they have the right to contact you and have you essentially stop processing that data until you either rectify the issue or neglect or just stop processing the, their data completely. Um, one thing you, you can do is you're allowed to continue storing their data unless they have a right to forgotten be forgotten requests in with you as well. So you can keep the data, but essentially you've got to stop doing anything with it. So if you're a direct marketing company, you can no longer contact that individual or use their data for any analytical purposes. Um, All right, right, right of data portability. Essentially the right of the data subject to uh, get some of that information that you're processing or all of that information. Um, and it really only applies uh, when it's personal data that that individual has provided to you as a controller. Um, and where the, the processing is based on the original consent or the performance of a contract um, and when it's carried out by an automated means. And so that will apply to a lot of our, our SaaS clients, right, our SaaS providers. And so really what's required here, um, again, have a process to recognize and respond to these type of requests. Um, and the data needs to be provided in a structured, commonly used format. So if an end user, a non-technical user is asking uh, for their, their data and you uh, provide them a JSON file that that might be considered uh, to be a non-usable format. So a CSV or an Excel file <laughs> might be the more readable format, just as an example. Um, the information needs to be provided free of charge, basically within a month. Um, and if the organization is unable to act or does not want to act, that needs to be explained um, in response to the request. Cool. And then the right to object. Um, similar to some of the other rights, if a data subject um, 
doesn't want you to send you the processor data anymore. If you're a direct marketing company and they don't want you to contact them, they've got that right to send you withdrawal consent and that you've got to respect that right um, and stop processing any of their data. We'll talk about this in a second also, but that needs to be included in the privacy policy. So if you're a data controller, you're responsible for the privacy policy, communicating it to the data subject, and that needs to be in there as well. All right, rights related to automated decision making and profiling. So uh, automated decision making uh, under the law, under the GDPR law, uh, is really making that decision without any human involvement. Uh, and profiling is, is more specifically, um, you know, uh, using a set of data uh, to put someone in a specific category or profile and then make a decision about them. Uh, and so really this this type of uh, prof this profiling and automated decision making is prevalent uh, in the world today. Uh, obviously in credit decision making it's probably the most prevalent. Uh, and so it, you know it, it can be done, it can be carried out if it's necessary again for performance of a contract if there's you know credit decisions being made for instance. Um, and similarly, if it's authorized by, um, you know, union member state law, more a lot of detailed conversation needs to be had on that point. But um, essentially, uh, based on explicit consent. And so, um, really, what's required here again is that this has to be in the privacy policy. This has to be clearly communicated um, to the subject. And really, you have the organization or the data controller has to have a process in place um, to ensure that an automated decision has the right or has the option, excuse me, for human intervention, right? That that credit decision can be reviewed um, by a human uh, to see if it truly falls within the credit model or decision making uh, as, it, as it did. Perfect, accountability and governance. And there are just five or six of these areas left. So I know we're, we don't have a lot of time left. So I know we're moving very fast on a lot of um, deep material, but uh, essentially accountability and governance, we would expect, you know, you need to have an information security policy or a cyber security policy and that you abide by that. Um, the regulators expect that you're conducting periodic audits to ensure that your data privacy controls are actually operating as you would expect. Um, they normally expect to see some data protection content and any kind of security awareness training that you're giving to your employees. Um, and also that ideally you're reporting to the board of directors on a periodic basis with respect to the privacy programs uh, and your compliance posture. Uh, speaking to information risks, uh, this is really the the process of putting in a risk management a risk management framework in place, uh, maybe a reporting framework like SOC 2 as a way to organize uh, the internal control environment uh, to protect information assets, to protect personal data. And so there are a host of them. We talked about um, the ISO 27001 standard. SOC 2 is certainly um, a, a means of achieving the same ends and so and, and there are others um, but this is really also the process of adopting a formal risk assessment and management process across the organization identifying those risks to uh, the privacy of, of personal data that you hold um, and creating mitigation strategies revisiting them um, and making sure that uh, these things are carried through throughout the organization Next one, data protection by design. So essentially really talks about as you're building new systems or new programs that you really are building in privacy protections as a core element of those programs. Um, actually one semi-related question we just got in was really if I have data already in my system um, that I collected that's sitting in either my CRM system or an ERP system um, prior to the enactment of GDPR, must I now go back and scrub that data? Um, what you must do is go back and do the data inventory to make sure you understand what data you currently have you don't have to scrub it unless, of course, you get a request for rights of access, but it is ret retroactive. So GDPR does cover the data you currently have in your system and not just what you're going to collect from May 25th going forward. There's a requirement under the law to appoint a data protection officer, and I think there is there is definitely some confusion about this. How, how could we do that? How can we afford that for smaller organizations? Um, so, First off, it doesn't have to be um, an individual that owns only that responsibility. So it can be an employee of the company or, or somebody um, who's a third party consultant, um, and they can own other responsibilities within the organization as well. Um, here again, we've got sort of the, the 200 the companies or organizations with 250 or less employees. This requirement again is less stringent. 
One thing there, you can have one data protection officer that covers the entire company. So you, you don't have to have one for each of the EU member states. Uh, but that was a question that they were working on as they came up with the this the regulation. Uh, but since you can just have one person that does it for the entire company. Um, the next one is a requirement for either a privacy impact assessment or a data protection impact assessment. So the regulation says you must carry out a DPIA when you're using new technologies that will have a significant impact on processing data that is of high risk to data subjects um, or to the rights and uh, rights and freedoms of those individuals. But one of our recommendations is that it, it's a fairly, we think, pretty easy thing to do in the document. Uh, we think it's a valuable exercise for most companies out there. The data protection impact assessment is really going through some of the core requirements that you should be complying with or have to comply with and talks through what controls you currently have in place to meet the requirements or what you're going to put in place to remediate any gaps that you have. Uh, there are templates out there. I know there's one from the AICPA. Um, obviously, we've got our own. Um, so the information is out there and publicly available. So we think doing a DPIA is definitely a good exercise for all companies. We have some uh, resources in that regard too. So if anybody has specific questions about how do I actually go about executing that, we can we can help you. I'm going to skip over information security based on time. This is really, you got to have an information security policy in place um, to govern um, the organization's control over uh, the information security assets uh, and, and data that's held. Um, but it goes, it goes hand in hand with uh, having a risk management framework in place, um, independent audits and internal audits over the same. Not necessarily one of the, the more stringent requirements, breach, breach notification. So the requirement says that as soon as you become aware of a breach, you have 72 hours then to respond. Um, if you're a data controller, you've got to respond to the supervising authority and potentially to the actual data subject themselves if you think there's significant risk to that data subject. And then in addition to that, if you're a data processor, you need to respond to your data controller within the 72 hours. So really that goes to how do you build a program that is really designed to achieve that very tight deadline. Uh, that's more stringent than we would currently see in the US. Um, California law is not to that level yet, um, even with the new requirements. Um, so really, how do you actually build and test a program that will ensure you can comply, but 72 hours is really the deadline that they put in place. Let's talk over some of the required documents, policies and procedures and other documents um, to help you all comply uh, with your responsibilities under GDPR. Cool. And again, you guys will all get a copy of this deck, so hopefully it'll be a helpful checklist to you. Obviously, you need a privacy policy. There's lots of things that need to be in that privacy policy. We've outlined some of the key elements in there. Um, a privacy governance policy is very important, um, and really that goes to how are you going to build a data privacy uh, process and organization to ensure that ongoing compliance with GDPR. Uh, you need a data classification policy. So essentially, you need to go through the data and understand how you're going to classify the data that you currently have from regular person identifiable information, the sensitive data to even non-sensitive data, so that you really are in a good position to respond to any of these requests. Um, your data management policy, key policies and documentation on how long you're going to keep the data, how you're going to dispose of data. Um, we also need a risk management policy. Uh, so there's lots of things that need to be documented for this. Risk management really is around, you know, what's your methodology, what's your process for assessing risk and updating your risk assessment on a periodic basis when it comes to privacy uh, and compliance with the GDPR. And then even more policies, you need an incident <laughs> management policy. Um, essentially how, and that's different than a breach notification policy, sorry, an incident, incident response policy around what are the key roles and responsibilities, what tools do you have in place, what's the response procedure, what's your plan of action. Uh, different than a breach notification, incident management can really be around you know, security incidents that you've had, uh, but that may have a potential a potential impact to the, the actual PII that you're collecting. Uh, breach notification policy, as I talked about a little bit earlier, uh, again, how do you build a policy and a process that will allow you to respond within that 72-hour deadline? And then information security policy, very standard. Obviously, most companies already have this in place. And then lastly, a data processing addendum. So essentially, the agreement between the controller and the processor around the legal requirements, the model clauses that are in there. Uh, lots of great examples out there. Lots of the big companies have them on the website. So for example, if you go on to you know, Salesforce's website, you will see their DPA on there. 
and essentially as a customer of Salesforce, you just sign on to that agreement, and therefore then you can show that DPA to any auditor, any compliance officers that may come to say that you've got that in place, and that Salesforce, as your processor, agree to be bound by the requirements of your processes and GDPR. That's a really great practical point, um, and that actually happened. Salesforce just finished their DPA. There was a lot of questions around that. When's it coming? When's it coming? Um, and that was, uh, I think, April 4th or so that they signed it. So it's, it's very new. Definitely hit that page if you're using Salesforce. I think I've seen a couple of CRM questions come across, and that's really, really relevant because um, you know a lot of organizations use Salesforce for a lot of different reasons. Uh, so but that is their AWS users. Um, same thing, there's a data processing uh, denim available to you uh, to execute and already have that in place. You can use those as guides as well for um, you know executing agreements with other parties that don't currently have them, so. All right. Cool, and then some of the questions we got in, um, can you outsource uh, the data protection officer role? Absolutely, you can. Um, obviously, we do it, and many other companies out there do it as well. Uh, that's a very common thing that you will have one one person act as a DPO for many, many companies. Okay. Um, there's a, oh, sorry, sorry. I'll, no. I'll answer one more quick question. Uh, B2B marketing, this is a big area for GDPR. Uh, so the question is, what if I'm a B2B marketing company? The data um, that I have is targeted mostly to businesses. Great question. Uh, the answer is yes, GDPR does apply. If you uh, maintain a database of um, names, contact names, and business emails, that is still personal data under GDPR and, it, and, and um, the requirements do apply. Um, and so typically uh, B2B marketing right now is falling under um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the requirement uh, is not consent, um, but uh, well, I just blanked on the sixth, legitimate basis. Thank you, Liam, under the sixth uh, requirement, legitimate basis. Um, and the other thing that's happening in this space is uh, the PECR, which is, um, uh, you know, privacy and electronic communications regu um, uh, standard out of the EU, and that's currently under review. It'll it'll be aligned. My understanding is it'll be somewhat aligned with GDPR, um, and so there's there's a lot of movement in that space right now. Okay, guys. So I know we're uh, cutting pretty close to time, but um, we're on to our fourth question. And then just a reminder, you need to answer 75% of the questions. So this might be your last chance to get CPE credit. Um, so the question is, when should my organization conduct a formal data protection impact assessment, or DPIA? Is it A, an annual basis, B, when implementing a new program, service, or technology, C, when asked by the data protection authority, or D, none of the above? Again, this is our last polling question. So. Um, in order to get CPE credit, you need 75% of the questions answered. And we're going to be closing the poll in a couple more seconds. All right. Three, two, one. All right. And here are the results. So it seems 50% of people say B when implementing a new program, service, or technology. Yeah, I would say that that is the right answer. B is technically the right answer. Um, but anybody who responded A is in some ways on the right track because uh, really the DPIA, uh, the process of assessing privacy impact, isn't isn't a one-time thing. Uh, it, it really is contemplated to be um, you know, an ongoing process, a periodic process. So certainly it's true. If there's a new service, if there's a new way of collecting information, a DPIA is required. Uh, but however, if this comes on an annual cadence and that DPIA is revisited, that is probably an even better uh, organizational control to have in place. All right, so we have two minutes for some of the questions you want to answer. Um, I'll hand it off to Liam and yeah, one of them is about uh, responsibilities to retain data by statute, um, i.e. tax records, for instance, uh, that conflicts with a right to be removed. Uh, there certainly is carve-outs for this uh, in the law, and so, um, you know, there's a lot of them to talk about, um, but but yes, there there is room in the law for that. Um, some of this data is, is required for legal purposes, for ongoing criminal adjudication, um, you know, or even even to retain it because a data subject has 
um, made an objection or a hold on the processing. And so that is a legitimate reason uh, to retain that data for that period of time, yeah. Cool. Question here on should there be a separate security policy for the company and the SaaS operation? Um, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, the more robust policy around the SaaS operation, uh, given the GDPR requirements, I think would be great to have. Obviously, you don't need to have the same level of requirements and stringency if you're as a company are otherwise not required to be compliant with GDPR. Who's the supervisory authority within the U.S. is a good good question. I mean, this is really an EU law, and the supervisory authorities are are uh, are EU um, are EU. Um, authorities. Uh, the U.S. privacy law right now is um, <laughs> sort of a, a, a fractured um, uh, law uh, or a fractured set of laws. A lot of them are state laws. Um, some of you may have seen in the news actually that a, a large judgment was just handed down um, out of Michigan for a privacy violation. Uh, so a lot of these things are being taken on by the states. Oregon has just Im implemented their own uh, state privacy law as well. So um, the yeah, there's actually some movement um, in Congress as well. There has been a proposal, um, um, as you all know, Mark Zuckerberg was on the Hill recently, and so there's been some action on that. <laughs> and uh, there's, a, there's a law proposed uh, for a, a comprehensive U.S. privacy law. All right. Well, thank you, guys. That was a lot of good information for our viewers here. Um, I know you guys have been asking us um, are we going to get a copy of this? So these slides are, is the webinar going to be sent? Answer is yes. We will send you a link to download the slide deck and record the recorded presentation within 72 hours. And again, in order to get your CPE credit, I hope you guys answered at least 75% of the polling questions. Um, thank you, Liam and Noah for uh, coming here today and educating us on GDPR and, um, Again, we will try to answer and send. Uh, try to answer all the questions that we've been getting um, in a separate email. So look out for that. Thanks to all our Thank attendees. You. Thanks, guys.